Good evening there everybody. What is happening? Hopefully y'all are having a wonderful day today. So when it comes down to it, I thought that of course I would review this little video by that of Dante's Boxing Nation. And once again, a certain amount of people always ask me why I like to review these videos. Because of course a certain amount of people, they have the valid point of saying, well, why do you really care overall about what they think? We all know that these guys that they kind of try and, you know, do this stuff for views or that, you know, they probably don't have that of the best of opinions or that they clearly have a racial or a bias issue. Well, the reason why I like to review it is kind of to set the tone for my channel to say that not only is this a logical and an objective channel, but that this is the problem with a lot of people in general, especially when it comes to that of analyzing that of debatable sports debates. Because many people, of course, they'll go into that of a racial issue or they'll go into that of a certain emotional issue because a lot of the times they're fans. And a lot of the times when someone is a fan, they will defend or they will try to detract by any means necessary their favorite fighter uh, or their least favorite fighter when it comes down to it, you know, whether they love them or whether they hate them. Dante's vaccination, of course, he's been trying to detract from Canelo Alvarez's career for a very, very, very long time. Every single one of Canelo Alvarez's fights, no matter who he fights, there's always some issue, you know, whether it comes to Gennady Golovkin, you know, oh, he beat him at 36 years old, you know, and it was controversial. And the first fight definitely was controversial. You know, Arasani Laura, he really lost that fight. And some could debate that he could have lost that fight. But even the other fights, like Billy Joe Saunders, Callum Smith, Miguel Cotto, Sergey Kovalev, and, you know, a lot of these other guys that he's been fighting, Danny Jacobs, Austin Trout, there's always something <laughs> to detract from that of Canelo Alvarez when it comes to that of Dante's boxing nation. And the reason why I like to review these videos is not only to expose certain narratives, but also to tell my viewers that we should always keep the same standards when it comes down to it. No matter who we're analyzing, we always have to use logic and objectivity. And if you don't use logic and objectivity, and I clearly see that there's an emotional standpoint in your view, I'm more than likely not going to take your view very seriously. So that's a big part of the reason why I like to review these videos because they don't always bring up bad points and I usually can see someone's perspective but it's very clear that Dante either A doesn't believe in what he's saying and I think that there's a big part of that when it comes down to it but I think that he also is so blinded by a certain racial bias when it comes on it and I get it because at the end of the day you see a certain amount of these fighters you know especially black fighters that are detracted by that maybe of the media or especially a certain amount of the fan base and after a while, you say, well, if they're going to do that to our fighters, we're going to do that to their fighters. You know, we're going to try and revise history or we're, you know, going to stick up for black fighters. And I get that. All that is well and good. But when it gets to the point to where, once again, it, it becomes, you know, to the point where you're trying to revise history and spread a bunch of bullshit and trying to detract from a fighter's career when we're having a serious and logical debate. That's when I kind of jump in and I say, no, I'm sorry. I can't agree with that. That's just my personal view of it. But that's why I like to review a lot of these videos. Anyways, Dante's Boxing Nation, he's going to give his take on the Jamel Charlo versus Canelo Alvarez fight. And I'm sure more than likely he's going to bring up the size excuse. And don't get me wrong, I'm not going to say that it's a complete invalid excuse. Very clearly, of course, Jamel Charlo, it was his first time fighting at a weight class of that sort. Do I believe that Canelo was a natural 168 pounder? No, I don't. Do I also believe that Jamel Charlo could easily fight at 160? Yes, I do. But it is what it is. But anyways, you know, Dante's boxing nation, he's going to talk about it. In my personal view, did Jamel Trello get completely outperformed tonight because of the weight? No, uh, even though I think that it was a part of it. I think that Jamel Trello got outclassed because I think that Canelo Alvarez is an exceptionally all-time great fighter. And I think that Jamel Trello is a borderline great to very good fighter. That's what I think he's been. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. And that's why I always said that his unification even though, you know, it's very impressive and it's always great when you're, you know, a unified fighter. But as Boxing Eagle would say, because I like to review a certain amount of his videos, not all unifications are built the same. Not all of them are made the same. And in my view, you know, a lot of these people, including Ego and Dante, they always love to say the shit about, you know, oh, how, uh, you know, Jamel Charlo, you know, was unified in one of the deepest divisions in boxing, all this other shit. Uh, no, not really, because all the people that he beat, like Erickson Lubin, Tony Harrison, even Brian Gastano, I just don't know if a lot of these guys, you know, I'm not really sure if a lot of them were true A-grade level fighters. 
I know for a fact that a lot of them really were not true A grade level fighters. Now, I personally believe that Brian Gastano maybe was on the A minus level, but other than that, none, none of the other fighters were truly on that A grade level. It just is what it is. But you know, anyways, Mr. Dante's Box Nation is going to talk about it. Let's tune in. Dante's Boxing Nation, what's going on, guys? So Canelo Alvarez, he just got the biggest win of his entire career, completely dominating. And I understand, <laughs> and I knew that Dante's Boxing Nation more than likely was going to say that. Now this certainly is. Uh, now why is Dante's Boxing Nation trying to say this? Because he's saying that the biggest win of his career is a, over a guy that was 14 pounds lighter than him and was coming up two weight classes. So even though certain people may say, "Oh, well, Dante is trying to give him credit." It's not really him trying to give him credit. It's really him trying to detract from him. And, you know, just watch what Dante has to say. I bet I'm right. Jamel Charlo. And even if we're talking about Charlo, let's just say even if there wasn't a weight difference, you know, which in my view, there really wasn't as big of one as many people were trying to claim that there was. Would it be the biggest win of his career? No, in my opinion, it wouldn't be. I think that Gennady Golovkin, of course, was a much, much bigger win, especially in the rematch. Uh, when it came down to it, I think that you could debate that Miguel Cotto is a bigger win. Well, of course, when you talk about pound-for-pound pound rankings, one could debate that Jamel Charlo was bigger than Miguel Cotto. But I just, of course, think that Miguel Cotto is a much more skilled fighter than Jamel Charlo. You know, but, uh, you know, one could say, that just in terms of skill set, I would say that there are several fighters that, you know, Canelo fought that were better uh, when it came down to it. You know, a decent amount better than Jamel Charlo, really, to be honest with you. But, uh, you know, in, in terms of pound-for-pound pound ranking, yeah, you could say that this is certainly, you know, top three. That's the good news. The bad news is it was against the junior middleweight champion. Yep, see, ex <laughs> exactly, exactly as I predicted. Who had to move up 14 pounds, and we could see the size difference from the first round. Matter of fact... Oh, please, dude. In fact, Jamal Charlo looked bigger than Canelo Alvarez in this fight. Get the fuck out of here with this goddamn size excuse. Isn't this interesting that Canelo Alvarez, when he fought Dimitri Bivo, Aki, and Dante, they were saying that it's skills that pay the bills, not the size. You know, all this other shit, you know, because Canelo, you know, he rehydrated at 185. Even though we all know damn well he's not a natural light heavyweight fighter, you know, when it comes down. So it's like, come on, you know. And then when it comes to Lomachenko, you know, they never gave him the excuse, you know, that he clearly was not a natural lightweight fighter. You know, they never clearly gave him that excuse, even though both of those excuses were somewhat valid. Even though, of course, I don't think Lomachenko, uh, I think that if he's on the level that many people said that he was, that he should have beat both Lopez and Devin Haney, in my personal view. You know, but it is what it is. But the, they, they never used a quote-unquote size excuse for those guys. But then when it comes to Jamel Charlo, oh, you could clearly see the size difference. Get the fuck out of here, man. Jamel Charlo looked bigger than Canelo Alvarez in this fight. When they did their face-off right before the first bell rang, when the referee was given instructions, Canelo Alvarez looked way bigger than Jamel Charlo. No, he didn't, dude. Just stop. I'm not saying that Canelo Alvarez isn't girthier for his size, but at the end of the day, Jamel Charlo is like, what, 5'11", 6 foot, you know, with a 73-inch arm reach, and on top of that, Canelo Alvarez is, what, a legit 5'8", and on top of that, sure, he probably rehydrated a little bit heavier, and he's probably the more built guy, but come on. You know, it's not like it was that far off when it came down to it in terms of the clear rehydration. It was very clear that Jamel Charlo, in my view, that he was at a relatively healthy weight when it came down to it and that he was going to be able to compete in terms of the size. He was going to compete in terms of the skills. I think anyone who watched that fight would agree with me, regardless if you're a Canelo Alvarez fan or not. The no, I don't think anyone would agree with you. I think that your pro-black fans will agree with you. Because they also have a racial narrative afoot to try and detract Canelo Alvarez. You know, but no, the majority of us would not agree with you. And like I said, you know, if you want to take a look at a real size disadvantage in terms of something moving up weight classes, you could take a look at Rigondeaux versus Lomachenko. Uh, you know, you could possibly take a look at some other fights out there that maybe I'm not thinking of. You know, this was not one of those fights, okay? Size definitely made the difference because we've never seen Jamel Charlo look like that against any opponent. We yeah, you know why Jamel Charlo looked like that? Because Canelo Alvarez is an all-time grade level fighter. But Dante, once again, every every single time that Canelo Alvarez is in the, is in the ring with someone, it's always because of some sort of bullshit factor. It's always because of the size or the age or all this other shit. But then when it comes to other fighters, and once again, 
If you want to use those standards, that's up to you. I wouldn't agree with them. But the thing is about Dante is that he never keeps the same standards, depending on what fighters he likes and which ones he doesn't. You know, so once again, like I said, get the hell out of here with that. Seen a complete different Jamel Charlo because he had to move up to weight classes. And Canelo was walking. It wasn't a different Jamel Charlo at all. It was the exact same Jamel Charlo that I seen in 154. Like I said, the difference is, is that Jamel Charlo was used to fighting these guys that were clearly not A-grade level fighters. Guys that clearly weren't usually on his same level of caliber. Canelo Alvarez, like I said, isn't even just an A-grade level fighter at his best. He's an S-tier level fighter. He's an all-time grade level fighter. He's one of the top debatable 20, excuse me, 20 to 30 greatest fighters of all time. Some would even possibly put him in the top 10 of all time. Not quite sure if I would go that far as of yet. But Canelo Alvarez is up there when you talk about all-time greats. Okay, Jamal, the, the difference was is that Jamal Charlo's not an all-time great fighter. He's never been an exceptional fighter. And I've always said this. Through Jamel Charlo like he was in there with a fly. He wasn't even worried about the power because he knew he was much bigger and stronger than him. And because of that, Jamel Charlo, he gave Canelo Alvarez way too much respect. It's rather ironic. Because well, Jamel Charlo gave Canelo Alvarez way too much respect from the first round. You know, and I give Jamel Charlo a certain amount of respect. I still think that he's a borderline great fighter. He's accomplished a lot in his career and he is going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. But this is why I've always said, especially from the LDBC and the media channels, you know, from old media, you could say that he's a bit underrated, but from old media, he's like majorly overrated because there's no way that if you know shit about boxing and if you have somewhat of a consistent ranking system, that he's truly top five pound for pound because it's like, well, what, what the hell are we really going off of? Because he stops all of his opponents and, you know, he's undisputed in one of the weakest divisions in boxing. Like, oh, he beat Jason Rosario and Tony Harrison you know, overall, and, and a couple of other bums to get the belts. I was like, dude, who gives a shit? I mean, the only fighter that he ever beat once again that was worth a damn at that weight division and then and in his, you know, prime, and clearly not an aged fighter, like Austin Trout was Brian Gastano. That was the only one. And he really should have lost that first fight. Because the respect that Jamel was giving Canelo Alvarez in the press conferences leading up to the fight, that was the same level of respect he gave Canelo in the actual fight. Canelo Alvarez, he did a great job of cutting off the ring, forcing Jamel Charlo to the ropes. It was interesting, though, because when Jamel Charlo stood his ground and kept the fight in the center of the ring, Canelo Alvarez was more cautious. It wasn't until Canelo... No shit. You mean that when... You mean when Jamel Charlo... You mean when he tried to go forward with his attack and change the tempo that Canelo Alvarez was more cautious to make sure that a trap wasn't incoming? What a dumbass. Like, like this is what I mean. Like, there's no way... That Dante's boxing nation actually means a lot of the stuff that he says. Like, this dude, if he truly is like this, he doesn't know anything about the sport of boxing. It's like, no shit. At Jamel to the ropes, that's when you've seen all the confidence from Canelo Alvarez. The reason why Charlo kept finding himself against the ropes because he was trying to back up. He was taking little small steps back. It's because he couldn't land the jab. That's the reason why Jamel Charlo was super afraid to throw the jab since round one. And even when he tried to land the jab and land combinations, he could not land the jab. I'm pretty sure I seen Jamel Charlo land about three solid punches in this fight flush. They were all left hooks. That was about it. I did not see Jamel Charlo land a single flush jab in this fight. Did not see him land one flush right hand. At least that wasn't on a replay. He was trying to set up Canelo with a counter punch. But Canelo would not throw a punch until he backed Jamel up to the ropes. Which at one point he caught Jamel Charlo with a great right hand that knocked down Jamel Charlo. The interesting thing is Jamel Charlo, he expected Canelo Alvarez to slow down in the later rounds. And Canelo, he actually did slow down. The problem was... Canelo Alvarez, in my view, he still showed that his stamina is a little bit... I'm not going to say bad, but it's still a little bit finicky. But I'll give Canelo Alvarez a lot of credit. He did show up in great condition in this fight. Uh, you know, on top of that, uh, he paced himself really well in this fight. And he showed that he was able to, you know, at least at least win this fight quite dominantly. This reminded me a lot of his performance over Chavez Jr. Of course, not quite as dominant, you know, when it comes down to because he, be he beat the shit out of Chavez Jr. You know, I remember that fight. They were promoting the hell out of that fight of two Mexican hombres and all this other shit. And then Chavez Jr. went out like a sucker in that fight. 
which of course doesn't surprise me because Chavez Jr. has never really been a great fighter. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, you know, but that's that's what this fight kind of reminded me of. You know, where Canelo Alvarez, he was pacing himself. He didn't quite look, you know, as good as what he would a little bit later on. Kind of like in this fight, he didn't look as good as what he did a few years ago, in my view. But he looked pretty good. He certainly looked better than what he did against John Ryder. Charlo didn't do enough damage in the earlier rounds to capitalize. So now Canelo Alvarez, he gets the biggest win of his career, and it's the biggest win because he beat Well, no, he uh, got one of the biggest wins of his career. Him with no controversy. So now we see what's... Once again, if you're going to go by those standards, no problem. So let's stop calling Sugar Ray Leonard an all-time great fighter if we're also going to detract from Canelo Alvarez and other fighters by those standards. Let's stop calling Sugar Ray Leonard an all-time great fighter because he lost to Sugar, excuse me, he lost to Roberto Duran in the first fight. He really should have not gotten a draw in the second Tommy Aaron's fight. He really should have lost that fight. And many people believe that Marvin Hagler won. So that must mean that Sugar Ray Leonard's not an all-time great fighter then, right? That must mean that he's not top 10, top 20 all-time. That must mean that Andre Ward is not an all-time great fighter because the biggest one of his career, you know, against Sergey Kovalev in the first time, there was controversy, at least a lot of people thought it was, and the second time, a lot of people thought it was a low blow, that it was a controversy, like, get the fuck out of here. Thanks for Canelo Alvarez. Now, the winner of David Benavidez versus Andre will be Canelo Alvarez's mandatory. And isn't it very interesting how Jamel Charlo can be top five pound for pound, even though every single big fight in his career has been filled with controversy? Ain't that a bitch? <laughs> Canelo Alvarez, he loses to Demetri Bivol, who's a natural light heavyweight, and Canelo still undisputed at super middleweight. But Canelo gets kicked off the top 10 pound for pound list, according to these dudes at the LDBC and, you know, uh, newmedia.com, you know, New Media Inc., when it comes down to it. But, you know, <laughs> but, but Jamel Charlo, he loses to Tony Harrison, a dude who never won a belt and lost every big fight in his career by knockout before that at Jamel Charlo. And on top of that, he should have lost the first Brian Gastano fight. And, oh, he's top five pound for pound. Like, get the fuck out of here. So if the WBC does what they're supposed to do, then they're going to strip Canelo if he does not fight the winner of that fight next. And then you have Terrence Crawford, who also wants to fight Canelo Alvarez now. You know... Speaking of Terrence Bud Crawford, Terrence Bud Crawford needs to stay the fuck away from Canelo Alvarez. You know, if Canelo looked like what he did in that of the John Ryder fight, or if this was a seven rounds to five fight, you know, I would maybe understand. But, <laughs> you know, no, this this was like an 11 rounds to one and 10 rounds to two fight for Canelo Alvarez. Now, uh, Terrence needs to stay away from him. He needs to try to fight Jamel Charlo at 154. Uh, Jamel, I don't think that he suffered that much damage in the fight. It was not as much of a war, you know, probably as anticipated because Jamel really, I mean, if we really want to go there, he pretty much just ran around in this fight. <laughs> Canelo Alvarez is almost starting to be like the Tommy Fury of boxing right now because you have a lot of these smaller fighters coming after Canelo Alvarez thinking that they can beat him. Just like you have YouTubers thinking that they can beat Tommy Fury, Tyson Fury's little brother, who's a professional undefeated boxer. Jake Paul, he tried to beat him and he lost, which is similar to Jamel Charlo trying to beat Canelo and he lost. Yes, it's very similar. It's very similar with a guy who's a YouTuber who's not really, uh, you know, a pedigree professional boxer trying to beat an actual professional boxer versus a guy that really is probably a dude who should be fighting at middleweight and Canelo Alvarez, who's not really a natural super middleweight. Two guys that are allegedly top 10 pound for pounds. That's exactly similar. Yes, this dude is such a fucking moron. Now you have K like either Dante is the biggest genius in the world or he's the biggest idiot in the world because if he actually believes in a lot of the shit that he's saying he's a complete dope but if he's actually overall just doing this reviews and to convince a lot of people of what he's saying he's a damn genius and it's very unfortunate that a lot of these idiots actually eat up this shit like it's just ridiculous. Sorry. Who's going to try to beat Tommy Fury, which is analogous to Terrence Crawford being up next to try to beat Canelo Alvarez. Obviously, this is not to imply that. And if I'm Canelo Alvarez, I'm not really entertaining that Terrence Bud Crawford fight. There's no reason to fight Terrence Bud Crawford. If Terrence Bud Crawford beats Canelo Alvarez, you know, oh, you know, I lost to the guy, you know, overall that moved up multiple weight divisions and is a natural 147 pounder. And if I beat him, what credit am I really going to get anyway? And so it's like, come on. Uh, Tommy Fury is on Canelo Alvarez's level. 
The only similarities is you have major underdogs that think they have a chance of beating the overwhelming favorite. Let's see who Canelo Alvarez decides. Isn't that interesting? The overwhelming favorite. You know, wasn't he talking all this shit about, you know, this might even be a potentially more easy fight, you know, for Jamel Trouble than Brian Gastano? If they were in the same weight class, it would be such an easy fight. Like, come on, dude fight next that's all i got for now guys i'm on to the next one all right now check this out but anyways that's pretty much about it but i just thought that that was hilarious dante on his usual haterade bullshit but we all know that dante once again has a racial issue and we all know that he does not like canelo alvarez and he's never going to because his goal once again is to make sure that fighters like canelo alvarez that they're not remembered as all-time great fighters that's what his goal is just as a certain amount of the mayweather detractors their goal was to try and make sure that, you know, they made it seem like he was ducking and dodging all these guys, uh, you know, even when he was fighting a great competition, you know, so he could be remembered in the most attracted way possible. But, you know, it is what it is. Anyways, that's pretty much about it. I just thought that that was very interesting, uh, you know, but anyways, that's pretty much about it. Talk to you all later.